when we started into this Healing the Orphan Spirit series, well, we didn't really know how long it was going to go, but we figured three to five messages or something like that and here we are on part 11. Um, last week Beth talked a little bit about inheritance. A couple weeks ago I talked a little bit about the authority we receive from the Father. I want to flush that out a little bit together and I think we'll see that authority flows from out of inheritance. And there's a process to inheritance. If an immature person receives a large inheritance before they're mature enough to handle it, it's often placed, uh, they'll, they'll likely do harm to themselves. Uh, fast cars and fast living that are more than they're ready for. Uh, indulgence in alcohol and drugs and other dangerous lifestyle change choices. So when a young person receives an inheritance, it will often be put in a trust with someone overseeing it to protect the child's interest, to keep them from doing foolish things out of their immaturity. Um, even a king rising to the throne at an early age will have a regent who does the actual governing until the young king is ready. Uh, and I think the father speaks to us much as he did to the older son in the parable of the prodigal son. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. The inheritance is there, and it has been all along, but he doesn't actually, didn't actually give him everything. I think it's much the same with us. Um, everything our Heavenly Father has is ours, but he doesn't give it to us until we're ready. Uh, leave Hetland says that we have to understand what we have inherited. Uh, then we have to value it. Then we have to steward it. Then we can multiply it. And then we get authority. And we'll try to make sense of all that. Hebrews 1-2 says, In these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the universe. So Jesus is the heir of all things. Nothing has been held back from him. Everything the Father has is his. Romans 8, 17 brings us into the picture. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. All that, we, all that the Father has is Jesus's, and we're co-heirs with him, so all that the Father has is ours as well. But there's some process. It isn't all instantaneous, and it shouldn't be for our own good. So let's take it from the top and kind of work through the process. First, we have to realize our identity as sons and daughters of the creator of the universe. If you don't know that um, you are an heir and don't know that a, an inheritance has been bequeathed to you, it doesn't really do you much good. Your, your circumstances haven't changed at all. Beth did that activation early in this series with the old identity card and the new identity card to bring home to us that we are beloved sons and daughters of the Most High God. So once we understand our identity as beloved sons and daughters, then we can develop intimacy with the Father. Spend time with Him. Spend time reading His Word. Spend time in prayer. Spend time listening to Him. Hetland says, when you have deep intimacy and you have it because you already know your true identity, you will experience the Father's presence. And when you experience His presence, you will abide in His pleasure. I want that. I want to experience the Father's presence I want to abide in his pleasure. Without that intimate relationship, you might be in the Father's house, but it doesn't feel like home. You may be in the Father's family, but you still feel like an orphan. Um, when you have deep intimacy with the Father, you don't have to hope you're good enough. You know you're good enough. 
Some people want to jump right to the authority and skip over finding their identity in Christ and going in deep intimacy. They, they want to claim the inheritance right off the bat. So once our intimacy, our identity is established and we have developed that deep intimacy with the Father, now we can talk about inheritance. And the first thing we have to do is value what we've been given. If I were to give you a piece of jewelry and you thought it was costume jewelry from the, from the dollar store, you'd treat it as something that wasn't very valuable. Um, if you lost it, you wouldn't put any much effort into finding it. But if you knew it was crafted with real gold and a, and a genuine diamond, uh, you'd value it a good deal more. And, and if you did lose it, you'd take better care of it. If you did lose it, you'd put considerable effort into finding it. We have an incredibly, an incredibly valuable inheritance. Look back at the verses we read in Hebrews and Romans earlier. His, his son whom he appointed heir of all things, and we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. What could be more valuable than our inheritance? God's provided a heaven full of resources that he wants to see his sons and daughters bring to earth. Everything in our Father's house is ours. It's our inheritance. Many people wonder why we see so little of it, but one of the reasons is that we just don't really know how to value it. One of the reasons we write such small checks on our uh, heavenly accounts is that we don't know the value we've been given. Once we come to truly value what we have been given, that sense of value will result in our stewarding what we've been given. That stewardship will uh, result in multiplication, and that multiplication will then result in authority. Learning to value and properly steward what we've been given is a matter of maturing. Uh, we are much more careful what we give little children than what we give mature adults. We have to go through a process of maturity so that we can handle the inheritance <coughs> we receive in a way that helps us and does not hurt us. That's why the Father can say, all that I have is yours, and it's still not in your hands. It's yours to inherit, but perhaps not yet to possess. You have to learn to value what you receive so that you can steward it well. Whatever you know how to steward, you'll know how to multiply. And you value and steward what you receive by honoring it. It wasn't until he lost lost it all that the prodigal son learned to value what he had received from his father. <clears throat> learned to value and honor um, what he received from his, from his father. He didn't steward well up to that point. I think if the story had continued, you would see that he honored his father, uh, valued what he got from his father, and, and stewarded it unlike he did before. If you steward what you receive from the Father, he will multiply it for you. In the parable of the sower, the seed that fell on good soil produced a yield of 30, 60, or 100 times. So if we've gone through this whole process, we, we realize our identity in Christ, we go in deep intimacy with the Father, we value what he gives us, we steward it well, we will be good soil. We know the Father's heavenly seeds are incredibly good and so the multiplication will come. After all, this inheritance isn't so much for us as it's for the kingdom. Um, so the Father's going to make sure that it's, it's multiplied if, if, we're, if, if we're good soil. Let's go back to the story of the prodigal son. The father saw him coming from a long way off. His eyes were on the horizon, looking for him, hoping Somehow he would return home, and then he saw him. After running to his son and embracing him, the father said to the servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Bring a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. Never thought about this before, but where would that best robe have come from? I think it would have to come from the father's own wardrobe. Petland says that this robe represents 
justification by grace through faith alone. It's a, it's a robe of righteousness. The same invitation stands for anyone who struggles with sin. Through Jesus, the Father clothes us in robes of righteousness. The second thing he gave the son was a ring. And, and this likely would have been a ring with the family seal on it, not just a piece of jewelry. It's the Father granting authority to the Son. From this move, moment on, he moves at a different level of inheritance. Many be believers can say, I'm robed in righteousness. I'm a son or I'm a daughter, and so I'm a co-heir with, with Christ. But until you have the ring, you don't have the, the inheritance. The robe transforms you from a sinner to a saint. The Father sees it and sees righteousness. The ring with the family seal allows you to represent your Father. It's your authority. Many who have the robe look forward to inheritance one day in heaven. Some may even keep striving to receive their inheritance here on earth. The good news of the kingdom is that the inheritance has already been provided. We can begin stepping into it now if there's a genuine repentance that shifts the way we think so that we see ourselves as the Father sees us and then understand, value, steward, and multiply what we've been given. Then the ring of authority will be placed on your finger. From the moment that the Father puts a ring on, your, on our finger, we can live from a spirit of adoption rather than uh, as orphans. He can trust you because you truly have his heart as a son or daughter. The prodigal son was always a son, but he was a rebellious son with self at the center of his life. When the father did give him the ring, he had the responsibility to steward his father's estate. Because of the regret he had over his past mistakes, he would no longer have had a desire to squander his father's wealth. When we get a revelation of who we are and whose we are, we don't have a desire to return to anything else. There's a connection between knowing our inheritance and taking responsibility for it. And it's, it's an important connection to remember. What we do not understand, we don't know how to value. What we don't value, we don't know how to steward. What we don't steward, we'll not be able to multiply. And whatever we don't steward and multiply, we don't have authority over. At the end of the story of the prodigal son, we find the celebration that the father gives the returning son. It's a, a covenant meal because the inheritance comes from a covenant, not a contract. A contract is conditional based on what each party does. A covenant is based on who we are. Uh, it implies an unconditional relationship. We are one with the Father and in covenant with Him, not, not based on our performance, but on our identity. Once we have become one with Him, the invitation is there for us to enter into the party, into the covenant. God has prepared a wealth of inheritance for those who love Him. Uh, we did nothing to achieve it, we can only receive it, and that's the way of the kingdom. Those with an orphan spirit are achievers, so they try to get try to get the inheritance. For sons and daughters, the inheritance gets you. It's it's available without measure to, for those who learn how to steward it. First Corinthians two twelve says, "What we have received is not the spirit of the world." but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. There are no limits on what we've been freely given. What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love Him. So this is really an amazing promise, and it's ready for us when we are ready for it. The first part of Ephesians explains things beautifully. God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. He chose each of us long before the world was ever created, and in love, 
he calls us holy and blameless. He adopted us as sons and daughters to be part of his family. Oops. I think I was behind on my slides. He has freed us from sin, not for us to struggle, but not for us to struggle to be barely free, but to be completely and abundantly and free of Christ. Then in unfolding his will, he has given us an extravagant inheritance. And he guaranteed it with the Holy Spirit, providing for everything we will ever need and bringing us into his plans. His guarantee means he will finish the work in us. Paul prayed for a spirit of wisdom in Revelation so that we will know the hope of our calling, the riches of our inheritance, and the greatness of God's power for those who believe, because inheritance is for the mature. And so Paul's prayer for the Ephesians will be my benediction for you today. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in all my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and power, authority and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Amen, amen.